Hello. Welcome to the latest edition of the Tech Talk. Today's topic that we're going to talk about is our C-Series integration with UCS Manager. Uh, I want to go ahead and introduce the panel that we have today. We'll start with Robert. I'll let you introduce yourself. Good morning. I'm Robert Novak, Gallifreyan on Twitter. I'm a Cisco champion, a blogger at rsts11.com, and a two-and-a-half-year survivor of Cisco UCS C-Series, almost two years of it integrated. Glad to be here today. And Steve McQuarrie? Hello, my name is Steve McQuarrie. I'm a technical marketing engineer with Cisco. I uh, focus on a lot of infrastructure and architecture, but over the last three years, I've had a um, great deal of focus on C-Series integration with UCSM. No, thank you both. So let's go ahead and start off and, and talk about some of the you know, common use cases that we see a customer uh, using our rack mount servers for. Uh, that'd be a question for you, Steve. We'll start off with you. Sure. So, you know, rack servers have some capabilities that blades don't have just due to the form factor, right? They're larger. They um, typically have, you know, a lot more spindles available. So when people need a lot of drives or various RAID configurations, when they're looking maybe for a RAID 5 and a RAID 1, or a specific PCIe card, you know, GPU, a PCO, PCOIP accelerator, or even really, really high amounts of memory, which you may not be able to fit into a blade server, that typically drives people in, into the rack server space. Yeah, so it's really about the scaling out horizontally, or sort in, in your in your one particular server, where you can have more CPUs, more memory, and a lot more drives. So things like big data uh, use cases and whatnot, and having absolutely. a lot of different RAID configurations on your storage. Yeah, so I know absolutely. that I know that customers like Robert are um, using uh, our rack servers with UCS Manager. Why would a customer want to do integration? of our rack mount servers with UCSM, what are some of the advantages? So, you know, you know, you personally know, Eric, and I know a lot of our customers know that UCS has the unique ability to abstract many of the common server um, tasks, right, through the use of our service profiles. So, for example, I can create a policy for my BIOS settings, my boot settings, my firmware management. Um, I can create a policy to upgrade my BIOS and firmware. I can schedule this, track the maintenance through the system. I get faults alerted through the system. It gives me a consolidated view of my infrastructure, my inventory. So it, it really defines the server as the service profile, not necessarily the, the hardware. And we call the service profile abstraction, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about um, mobility and statelessness. Now, when you bring the C-Series into it, you know, when you start doing local drives, we start saying, well, now the server has state, but not necessarily, right? So if I have a C server running under, you know, UCSM, for example, let's say I've got eight hard drives, you know, I'm running it as a bare metal Linux box using it, using it as an NFS server. Um, you know, I've got it booting up on a pair of RAID 1s, the rest of the drives are RAID 5. There's absolutely state to that box. But because it's under UCSM, the box is defined by the service profile itself, not actually the hard drives. So I could create a new service profile. Let's say something happens in my infrastructure, in, in my environment. Somebody comes to me, and I've got to have a virtual server immediately. But I don't have any hardware. I've got this NFS box. It's not really doing a lot. Maybe I'm using it in the lab for some reason. I go create a new service profile, new identity, new MAC address, new worldwide port name. Set up the um, drive. Set up the set up the boot policy not to use the local drives and don't mess with the configuration of the local drives. Basically, just leave them alone, but set it up to boot from SAN. You know, use the shared storage from SAN. I could take that service profile, apply it to that box that was running as my NFS server, bring it up, run ESX on it until I actually get the hardware, then go back, take the service profile that already exists, already has the configuration servers, or configuration, everything running from an identity standpoint, put it on the new hardware, bring my NFS server back up. So the flexibility and the capabilities of being able to do that, it, the infrastructure just becomes something you use with UCSM, right? It's not defining the server. And we talk about it a lot with, with racks, but I don't think we give it enough credit when we talk about integrating blades. So really, it, it, you know, the service profile is, is truly form factor agnostic. We can do everything we can do on a blade with a rack mount. You can do policy-driven management from, like you said, the, uh, all the infrastructure configuration for the BIOS settings, boot order, the firmware versions, just like we can on a blade with a rack mount server and under UCSM. Absolutely. No, that's great. So 
I think it'd be, you know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the logical side, the service profiles, the pools, the policies, they react the same way. How are the C-Series servers connected physically with the UCS manager in kind of comparison to uh, what we support for, um, you know, our blades? And what does that so, apply to the yeah, so, so if you don't mind, I'd like to take some time and, and actually share some graphics because this has changed a little bit over the, um, o over the course of us doing this. So I'm going to bring up, a, bring up a graphic here. You guys see this okay, I assume? Yep, we can. Excellent. So, um, you know, when we entered into the server market, we, we really didn't have a rack offering. You know, UCS came out as, as blade servers. And one of the things we quickly learned is our customers said, you know, if you're going to be serious about this, you're, you're missing a big gap in your portfolio. You don't have rack servers, and not everything runs on a blade, so we need you to build rack servers. So we started doing that just shortly after we announced the blades and, and started shipping those pl platforms. We started building racks. But we didn't initially make them part of UCSM, but the plan was always to do that. Our initial entry was um, using a standalone management controller. We, we call this the Cisco Integrated Management Controller, or Cisco IMC. Basically, it's you know, a baseboard management controller with some software that we wrote on it. But, as it turns out, we use the same baseboard management controller on both of our platforms. So it's as simple as changing what software is presented. Is it the software that's presented standalone to a customer, or is it a software that integrates tightly with UCSM that runs on that baseboard management controller? So in version 1.4 of UCSM, we actually said, let's pull the rack servers into UCSM. But to do this, we needed to be able to have a management connection so that the SIMC could talk to the Fabric Interconnects, to the UCS manager, right? And then we needed a data path connection for both the VHBAs and the VNICs. So we used a 2248 FEX, which is a fabric extender that has one gig copper ports, and we plugged the management ports, the, the LAN on motherboard management ports, into that, and then the data ports directly into the fabric interconnects. At this point, it was kind of a proof of concept. We were trying to show the capabilities that we had and see how customers re would react to this. And it turns out they, they liked it. But with this infrastructure, there were some very big limits to the scale and very limited servers that, that we actually connected here. So really, you know, it was, again, it was just the first step into our supporting uh, of a C-series server. Um, with I know with later versions of UCS Manager around the 2.0 timeframe, we started supporting um, the 2232 fixes. The uh, um, what did that topology look like, and you know, why did we transition away from using the 2248s uh, with version 1.4? So absolutely. This, in, interestingly enough, this topology that we're looking at here was only supported in versions 1.4 and 2.01. When we realized that this was something that customers did want to do, you know, we very quickly said, all right, we need to make this look like the, the blade servers do. Basically, we need a couple of IOMs. We need all the servers to, to connect to the IOMs. So in 2.02, we replaced the previous topology where we used the 2248s for management and connected directly to the fabric interconnects for data with the 2232 um, PPFX. As a matter of fact, the previous topology is deprecated. It, it's only supported in 1.4 and 2.01. The 2.02 moving forward, we went to this model. And this really mirrors exactly what happens inside of a blade chassis. Not a lot of people know it, but that SIMC in the blade chassis, the baseboard management controller, actually has separate wire traces to a separate network on the I.O. module that's then trunked up you know, to the um, fabric interconnects. And then, of course, the, the, CNA, the CNAs that the, have connections to the fabric as well. It doesn't really matter that much in a um, blade because you don't see the wires, but here we have to have separate physical wiring. So the reason we did it is it's much more scalable and it's much more cost effective because if I'm plugging things into a fabric interconnect, I'm paying a port license on a fabric interconnect, right? And I have limited number of ports on a fabric interconnect. With this topology, I can get 16 servers per FEX in dual wire mode, where 16 of the wires are going for management and 16 of the wires are connected to the data path. Oh, great. And so this really does, like you said, mirrors what we do with our blades. And one question I know we get asked a lot around this is, um, you know, I know that people say, well, can I mix and match 
blade chassis and things like this together? Or, you know, can I have C-series servers integrated with like a 2232 like we're showing here with, in the same domain, an ECS management domain, as my blade chassis? Yeah, that's a great question. We do get that. And, and absolutely, right? The limit or being able to do both racks and blades is truly what UCM, UCSM is about now. It's, it's form factor independence. We really don't care what you manage, right? There are some physical limitations to how many servers we'll allow you to have in the system. And that can be a combination of blacks and ray, <laughs> blacks and rays, sorry, racks and blades. Um, meaning that, you know, we have customers who have exclusively rack servers managed under UCSM. We have customers that have exclusively blade servers, but we also have a lot of customers that have a mix of those. No, that's, that's a great point. I mean, it, it just shows the flexibility of what we have with our management uh, paradigm with UCS Manager, where if you have use cases for blades and racks or for both, you can actually, we, we allow you to utilize both of those. I know with um, with UCS Manager version 2.2, we took the uh, the uh, you know, took this concept and, and and you know enhanced it a bit more, where we uh, um, and started supporting what we call you know uh, you know single wire in, in version 2.1. Um, I think that would be great to as a good transition to talk about how you know in version you know, 2.1 we started supporting that connected to the fixes. Yeah, absolutely. So we actually call it Single Connect now, um, but it was originally known as Single Wire Management, and this was introduced in version 2.1. So what we did here was kind of took a, a couple of standards and, and mixed them together. So, you know, with the, um, with the previous version, dual wire, there's a lot of wires to connect. Inside of the blade chassis, you never see those management connections. You, know, you plug it into a slot and everything's great, but when you start to manage, mess with a lot of wires, it's just... It gets messy, um, but we basically evolved that and using the VIC-1225, which is a Cisco adapter, the VIC-1225 SFP specifically, um, we use a combination of the pre-standard 802.1 QBR, a technology we call VN tagging, along with the distributed management task force standard known as NCSI, or Network Controller Sideband Interface, which allows a connection between the SIMC and the actual interface to carry management traffic, right? So we use a separate VIF or a virtual interface on the SIMC for the management traffic and no longer have a need for that extra management cable. So it gives us a lot more scalability. Now we can go up to 32 servers on a single fix. So, you know, you reduce your infrastructure needs by half as long as you're okay with the oversubscription rates of 32 to 8. You know, it, that, that becomes a, an option for the customer to be able to choose what that connectivity looks like, but it also reduces the cabling, and it fits really well into our overall, you know, um, story of convergence, right, in a converged infrastructure. No, this is great. I mean, it really does show this, you know, the different options a customer has to be able to do dual wire with any adapter, correct? You can, the, the previous example we were showing where you can, can you separate your data plane and your management plane, that can be done with any adapter, but this particular, what we're showing with single connect to the FEX is only done with a VIC-1225, correct? That's correct, and, and actually you can continue to do dual wire with the VIC-1225 if that's what you wanted to, but every other adapter that we support in the system um, is dual wire except for the VIC-1225 SFP. That is, that is the one that's capable of single wire. Well, I know uh, some customers may have a use case to, to have a couple rack mount systems, maybe not up to 32 or, uh, you know, 160 in their environment. Uh, I know, uh, what are some of the capabilities that a customer, if they wanted to add one or two environments, but not uh, a C-series servers in their environments, but not incur the cost of a, a um, you know, of the fixes, what, what, what are their options? So that's a great question. In version 2.2, uh, we actually introduced something called Direct Connect. So Direct Connect takes what we do in single wire management, which is allow to have a management connection, go through the same connection that our uplink for data, uh, ha data uses, and allows us to connect directly to the Fabric Interconnect. It's almost full circle back to where we started. If you remember when we started, we connected the data path to the Fabric Interconnect, but we had to have that separate infrastructure for management. This way, we can connect the data directly to the fabric and the management. And if you've only got a need for one or two servers to be integrated, you don't incur the extra cost of the FEX, the extra space in the rack, the extra power, extra you know maintenance cost, et cetera. It's just a direct connection. 
And if you wanted to migrate it later or add other servers, there's nothing that restricts us at this point from basically connecting all three types of, of, of connection within a UCS system. You could have direct connect of maybe one or two servers to the um, fabric. You could have dual wire management and single wire management all occurring within the same system. So it's little really allows you to really, to really allows you to support all the different topologies with all the different server and adapter types that we have. So if you have some old, older C series uh, like you know um, rack mount servers, you could put those in the dual wire mode, and then some of your newer servers you may want to you know, don't have as much network uh, um, keep you know needs. They they could actually be oversubscribed under a twenty two thirty two, and then secondly, do you direct connect for ones that you maybe need more bandwidth or something of that sort. Correct. Exactly. Now, there are actually a lot of connectivity options. Obviously, we don't have time to cover them today, but if anybody's coming out to Cisco Live in San Francisco next week, I actually have a two-hour session, um, BRK, BRKCOM 2010. It's on Thursday morning at 8 a.m., so you know, feel free to join me. I'd love to, uh, love, love to see people come out for that. No, that's great. So well, let's get to Robert started in the conversation here. Uh, sorry to make you wait a few minutes, but uh, I'm glad, no that, glad that you're on. I'm curious, um, you know, uh, why are some of the reasonings that you use the rack mount servers for your deployment and in, uh, in your environment? Sure. Well, the big thing is what Steve mentioned earlier, and uh, that's needing local storage. So when you're doing big data, you need a lot of local disk. You need a lot of options for local configuration. And we couldn't really do uh, Hadoop with the four, two or four drives on a blade server. Uh, I've seen it done before. It's not a good thing. Not very pretty. So we were looking for machines that would provide that uh, 8, 12, 24 disk local storage for Hadoop and for other big data platforms. We wanted the option to use different mixes of SATA, SAS, and PCI-based uh, flash devices for different platforms. And there's only so many cards you can add to a Blade server, like one and that kind of uh, limits you when you want to expand. Um, these are the reasons that we chose rack mount over blade. They're not really the reasons that we would choose UCS over other uh, products, but that it's definitely it definitely helps push toward the rack mount options that are very valuable in the UCS environment. So given that you could you could use a, a rack mount server either standalone or integrated with UCS manager, what are some of the reasons that you chose to use and, and manage your rack mount servers in this big data Hadoop environment uh, with UCS Manager? Very good question. Uh, the big thing that I found was the central management option. When you're dealing with five, six, seven hundred servers or more, it's it gets to be a pain to go out to each of them to check your firmware versions, check your configuration information, check for hardware errors. Uh, but you can do that centrally through UCSM. And now with products like UCS Central, which sits on top of uh, UCSM for some value of, on top, uh, you can see your entire environment in one place and handle inventory, handle uh, authentication for who has access to consoles, to configuration changes, things like that. When you've got a single, like if you're using the Cisco IMC or some of the other products out there on other platforms, People can log into any server's management console, and you don't know what they're doing. If everybody's going through the uh, UCS manager or through the XML API for other methods, you can tell who's logging in. You can decide what they have access to see and change, if anything. And when something goes wrong, you have the potential for an audit trail so you can see what got changed and when and why your entire VMware infrastructure went offline at 3.30 in the morning. Um, tied in with that is the simplified troubleshooting. If I log into UCSM today, I see up to 160 servers, and if I see them all reporting the same error, I know that there might be something in common. It's not just that each server has a problem. It might be an uplink. It might be one of my PDUs is down, so I've lost half my power supplies. Uh, but if it's not something like that, I can drill down and find which servers are having problems. Uh, and I think the last thing that I would bring up is the rule-based and later pool-based profiling. You can define the kind of machines you have and how they are to be profiled based on hardware characteristics and so forth. For example, 
any machine that has 24 hard drives or 12 3.5s and 256 gig of RAM might be known to be a Hadoop machine. So it gets set up with the Hadoop configuration, no RAID, uh, specific VLANs on the VNIX and uh, various other configurations, you know, no SAN boot because you're booting from the local disk, things like that. And it all goes toward the uh, model that I'm hearing sort of buzzwordy lately is changing your servers from being treated like pets to being treated like cattle. You, you remove the uniqueness of each server and you can deal with them in bulk with extreme efficiency. And that's what UCS Manager gave me as, a, as an administrator and as an architecture person. No, so having that centralized view and inventory where we do auto inventory of all the hardware and then creating rules to how you want to use those with the with um, like the service server pool qualification policies and server pools to dynamically dump them into policies make it easier for you to deploy because you know exactly what you're getting. You can define exactly with the server that you want. Those are those are great points. I'm I'm assuming that, you know, as you're you've been a DCS customer for a number of years. I'm, uh, I'm assuming that um, it, it took a little bit of a learning curve to, to get to this point. So I, it'd, be, it'd be fun to talk a little bit about some of the stages of how you first deployed UCS, what things you've learned, and, and then go and, and then describe a little bit about, um, you know, how you're doing it today from that stage. Uh, I know you first did a lot of deployments with your service profile templates but no pools, so I think it'd be great to, to start there. Okay. Well, just a, a quick preface to that. When we initially rolled the machines out, UCSM wasn't released for C-Series yet. So I had about two, 300 machines that were individually deployed, individually managed through Cisco IMC. And it was interesting. It was, it, I was definite, I spent about five months asking every couple of weeks, when do we get UCSM? When do I not have to go to every single web console? And it it's kind of like if you get a really nice car, but then you take it into the shop and you get a loaner that's, uh, you know, doesn't have power steering or whatever, and then you get back to your car with the power steering. It's it's night and day, and that's kind of how I feel going to, to UCSM on this volume. But um, you're right. We did start out with uh, service profile templates, and we could define with some advanced planning how the network and storage were configured. Uh, and we were able to do that unified. You know, there's one Hadoop policy, there's one Vertica policy, there's one uh, application server policy, there's one infrastructure policy. But you have to apply them individually per server with you, when you don't have dynamic pool qualification. So that means that, you know, 300 servers, 300 Hadoop servers, you're applying a policy to each one, and it's basically pets with serial names. Um, or kind of like how most people do their passwords. It's like, yeah, my password is now password 125, password 126, and uh, don't log into Google with that. Um, <laughs> so that was the that was how we did it first, and our first couple of pods went that way. Lived with that for about a year and uh, ran into a problem that I think I'm going to let Steve bring up either now or a little bit later. We had some fun with uh, Protect Configuration on the uh, storage configuration, especially when we were dealing with some machines with JBOD and some machines with uh, RAID configurations. Yeah, yeah. So, so local drive configuration was not something that we really planned for with UCSN. Like I said, you know, when we talked about it early on, it was about, or we, when it was developed early on, it was developed for blade servers. So our blade server portfolio, you know, it's two drives or four drives, pretty much. So there's not a lot of um, not a lot of options there. But one of the things that we understood is people would move service profiles off, like I was talking about the example earlier where I turned the NFS machine into an ESXi server. The one thing I didn't talk about in de detail that Robert's bringing up here is you have to be careful how you deal with that local data. So your local disk policy. Um, says, you know, hey, as I associate a service profile, I'm going to go through deep discovery, I'm going to look at what's going on, I'm going to change the, the, the data structure to what the local disk policy says. So if I had a system that had, you know, a RAID 1, and my local disk policy said uh, RAID 5, then it's going to go, oh, well, this doesn't match, so let me completely wipe out whatever you've got on the system and put it as a RAID 5. Now, we, we knew that was a problem, so we have this nice little checkbox on the service profile that says protect configuration. 
but it's a little counterintuitive. When I'm creating a service profile, I say, oh, I want to protect this configuration, so I would check that box. That's really not what it means. What it means is, as I apply this service profile, I want you to protect the configuration that already exists on your server. So, you know, Robert's case, let's say they had a system that was a, a bunch of, you know, RAID zeros or, or JBODs or whatever the case may be. If he applied a service profile that said RAID 1, but he didn't have protect configuration on, it would wipe all of that out. So that, that's kind of been a learning curve. Um, you know, we, as we talk to customers, we, we, we emphasize that a lot now because it's, it's a little counterintuitive. Um, you know, we, we're making great strides with the local disk policies. Uh, more things are coming. But, you know, it's a lesson to be learned, right, Robert? Yep. And it definitely it definitely drills in the history of the platform um, in a way that it, I only made that mistake about four or five times uh, last <laughs> week. Uh, no, actually, it's, I, I finally learned. Steve told me how, what it meant about five or six times, and now it kind of makes sense, and I can explain it to other people. So that's a good, good, a lot of good analogies of how you first started deploying. Um, you know, I know that uh, you, then after that first level of deployment, you didn't really use you know the, the the dynamic capabilities of the qualification policies and pools. What made you move into you know what made you actually start looking at that and how has that uh, been working for you? Uh, you know, just you know being able to define exactly the server that you want to be applied to that service profile. Uh, one of the big things was that pain of having to apply 300 individual profiles. Um, and one of the things that, that I still don't like about UCSM is that it's based in a certain uh, Redwood City-based uh, application platform and language, and it can be a pain to operate at times. But that's not a Cisco-specific thing. Everybody who uses Java has that pain. Um, but the other thing was we got a better sense of what we were deploying and how uniquely defined it was. So we could say, here's a pool, you know, 256 gig, 12 disks, VLAN uh, 5000 or whatever, make that a Hadoop profile. So then if you add, say, 100 of those machines, they match that uh, dynamic pool qualification policy and automatically get a profile created for them and, and assigned. So that way, for example, if you add another 20 a week from now, once the guys in the data center plug it in, it gets discovered, it gets a profile, and it's magic. Um, if I roll out another uh, you know, thousand machines, and I, I hope nobody from Cisco Sales is listening because that's just a random number. That's not, a, that's not an order. Um, you know, Roll out a thousand machines, and I want them to all be Hadoop. I've got that policy. It would go up through UCS Central, back down to UCS Manager, and you know I'm not assigning a thousand policies. I'm watching them get assigned automatically. So the complication that we found in this model is that if you change the server configuration without changing the pool rules, you know, like let's say you started out with your Hadoop machines being 128 gig each because you got a good deal on memory. And then you discover that your your data warehouse people need twice as much memory. You bump it up to 256, but your policy still says 128, and it reports a failure that's not really a failure. It doesn't stop the machine from working, but it gives you a warning saying that it doesn't match the policy and it can't be applied. So if you change your if you change your political policies, I would say, or your, your configuration policies, you need to change them in the uh, dynamic pool setup so that you don't get those errors or attach them to a different dynamic pool setup like big Hadoop and little Hadoop and just write Hadoop at 192 or whatever. Right, right. No, that makes a lot of sense. So it really, again, it becomes very prescriptive on how you pick the servers. You're getting the exact server with the processor types, the amount of memory that you want, etc. One thing that, that makes, you know, I think that you, you mentioned to me before that um, you found a couple servers that had some bad DIMMs in them, uh, mm -hmm. like part of the association process, like, hey, I ordered X number of servers, but I'm missing two from that, uh, you know, 100 servers that you were deploying. I only have 98 versus 100. So um, it'd be interesting to, to you know, you're, you're finding anomalies in your environment uh, because uh, by using these dynamic capabilities. Yeah, definitely. 
So, you know, if, it, it can be as simple as a machine got jostled on the receiving deck uh, and one of the DIMMs is loose. I've had that happen hundreds of times over the years. Uh, and when they come up, they have 92 gig or 88 or 64 or whatever. They don't fit the pool qualification, so they don't get policies. And then I go and I see, well, I ordered 100 machines. There's only 96. Let me go filter my inventory and find everything that's got the other qualifications. And then I see, okay, I've got these you know, C240s, for example, that should be in the policy, but they only have 84 gig of RAM or 82 or 76 or whatever. Um, and then I know that those four machines, I can send a data center guy out, or if I'm sitting there in the data center, I can go out, pull them out, reseat the memory, and then they come up, they discover or rediscover, and they get a policy. Likewise, if somebody, you know, if, I've, if I got some machines that had too much memory, uh, I probably would be a little bit quiet about it, but, you know, uh, make sure that we didn't get billed for it, and if we did, send it back, and... Uh, that way, you, you know you've got a homogenous environment if that's what you're expecting. And right. that's definitely a benefit to, both to the pools and to the UCSM model where you've got a central inventory. You can sort, you can filter, you can export. So, you know, if you want to load your information into something that doesn't have access to the API, you can get a comma-separated file and import it into something else and do all sorts of magic there as well. Right, this makes upgrades and, and or, or adding more capacity a whole lot easier because you just you really you know, rack them, stack them, plug them in, and then you know UCS Manager automatically inventories all of those for you, and mm -hmm. then you can you know they get thrown into the appropriate pools, and then all you have to do is to uh, you know apply a pop profile to it, and and then you know install your operating system after the association process is done. So it sounds like that, you know, in your particular role, a lot of the services you guys do, it makes you kind of like a service provider for your business. Um, how is, you, uh, you know, managing your C-Series servers and, and our blades as well, if you have any, uh, enabled you to, to make those delivery times faster uh, for, for your end users uh, in your environment? Very good question, and it's a, it's a definite benefit. One of the things is what I usually call going away from the snowflake model. Uh, when, when you've got homogenized configurations, when you've got a set of specific offerings and you're not adding a DIM or two, adding a disk or two for people, you have a standard option to off offer your customers internal or external, however your business operates. So, you know, we can say you want a, a bare metal Hadoop server. This is the configuration we've tested. We have this many available. We can expand your cluster. We can set up a dev cluster. We can set up a proof of concept cluster for a different application, things like that. Uh, for customers who are already working with us, we can replace machines very easily without changing the configuration or IP addresses or storage configurations just by reallocating or reassociating that service profile to a new piece of hardware, uh, which Steve had talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago, some of the other uh, uh, enterprise server manufacturers were experimenting with smart cards to hold the configuration. I don't know anybody who actually deployed them and used them the way they were designed, but what UCSM gives you is the effect of a smart card, but it's all built into the platform. You can pull that identity, put it on another machine. So, you know, motherboard fails, memory fails, disk fails, you know, it's all, hardware is going to fail. And if you've got some extra machines, you can just pull that profile, associate it to another machine, and it comes up and says, oh, I'm this other guy's name, dig me. So that, that speeds things up a lot. Uh, we can deploy new machines a lot faster with the dynamic pools, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, roll out 100, 500, 1,000 machines, and it doesn't take individual intervention on each of them. You only have the outliers to deal with. And the other benefit, and this is something that we're still working on uh, defining and deploying, is control of server management. You know, you can have, when you get to a certain size, you may have one team handling one set of servers, but you don't want them to have access to another set of servers. Uh, and by doing things like the organizations or with other forms of like role-based access management, you can say this team in this LDAP group has access to all the servers, 
this team in this LDAP group has access to this subset and you know you can also define what control they have you know these guys you know maybe your NOC can't change network configurations but they can reboot a machine they can re-acknowledge the machine whereas the you know your chief javelin catcher for UCS hi uh, can change anything and break anything and they've got a separate access control and that's all centrally managed it can be centrally audited and you know when you have people filter in and out of your knock your sysadmin team you can pull those using existing infrastructure without having to go to each machine and delete local accounts so that that management distribution is also a big thing when you're dealing with a lot of end customers and hundreds or thousands of servers so that's it, it doesn't really improve uh, delivery time but it definitely improves manageability yeah that makes sense I mean I, I've talked to a lot of customers that are you know looking at you know they have a, a, a their storage and network teams are a total different team than their server teams and you know they said hey we want to be able to manage and cable virtually even uh, you know cable the environment like we do with regular switches and such and that's why that's a good reason of one why we added LAN and SAN connectivity policy so you can segregate the server guy from the uh, role just to configure the BIOS, the boot order, and those types of things and let your SAN and LAN guy really configure um, you know how how many NICs or HBAs they have to uh, get uh, to utilize as well as how they're connected to their environment so you can enable things like you know compliance use cases and and, and, and whatnot so I mean, it's good. Good comments. I mean, that you, that you bring up of, uh, of how you're utilizing it. So, Eric, I want to interject something here for a moment. Yeah. Um, you know, you talked about the SAN and LAN guys, and there are a lot of customers where they do right. The SAN and LAN guys specifically go out and they manage, you know, everything down to the VNIC. Um, there are another set of customers where they don't care, right? It, that, that's like we'll give you the connectivity to UCS. You know, we'll, we'll go to the fabric interconnects. We'll tell you what VLANs need to be created. We'll make sure they're upstream. Now, here's your servers, you know, we, we trust you to do what you want. And that, that depends on the environment, but it does provide some empowerment for server admins in, in certain organizations. And, and again, that, that's really dependent on how the organization wants to deal with that. But the, all of a sudden, the server admin doesn't have to become a switch expert. Right? Even though a lot of them are, it's simply part of the service profile. Right, and, and then as, as you trap that service profile potentially moves from one blade or rack mount to another, that identity is, is captured, so then it makes it really easy to, if I have a failure at 3.30 in the morning on a blade and I can't get a part right now, I can actually move it to a spare blade or a rack mount server like you said before, and I don't have to call my network and SAN guy to, to recable things or rezone storage or or change any settings on the network side uh, and such. So it really allows that mobility and, and you know, that, that, that service mobility um, with the service profiles. And something else I want to bring up there that I hadn't thought of before in this context. Steve was talking about server guys being switch experts and sometimes vice versa. The way the networking in UCS works, you don't really have to deal with it on the same level. And that can be a good thing, but it can also really confuse the guys who are 100% route and switch. You know, you're not dealing with an individual network port that is your ETH0. Everything is going over the, uh, the VNIX on the single or dual connections. So you're not as worried about whether one port is up or down, shut down or no shut down. You're just dealing with everything's cabled incorrectly and we're controlling it through UCSM through the FI, the Fabric Interconnect. And that's it's hard to, to communicate that to people who are used to the standard rack and stack and uh, spaghetti cabling fun. But once you figure it out, it makes a lot more sense and makes it reduces complexity. And it reduces spaghetti as well. Because it allows you to logically carve out the amount of network bandwidth you want to give someone versus saying, you get one gig pipe or a 10 gig physical pipe or what have you, and, and then you may only be utilizing 5, 10, or 25% of that uh, particular pipe. Yep, and if you need more, if you need another VLAN, you don't need to run another cable. If you need uh, SAN or iSCSI storage, you don't have to add another NIC. It's uh, it, it's really liberating, and it gives you a lot of flexibility when you've uh, deployed that upstream to uh, you know just make the configurations. You may have to do a reboot for some of the configuration changes, but you don't have to have somebody open it up and put a card in and run fiber backhaul to the uh, core switch 
or to the sand switch or whatever. It's all, it, it's really converged. That's awesome. I mean, so given that you've been a customer for, you know, a number of years, you've went through a fair, fair number of firmware upgrades through the life cycle of, you know, the, the rack mount servers on the uh, standalone as well as being integrated into UCS Manager. I know some we've added some capabilities to do kind of the N minus one model for the infrastructure versus the server firmware level. How has that been received from you guys, um, and how are you guys utilizing that? Uh, very good question, and it's uh, it's made the upgrade process a lot smoother for us. the The way that firmware works in the UCS environment is you have an infrastructure firmware model or bundle that goes on your head-end uh, fabric interconnects and your fexes, your I.O. modules, blade chassis, et cetera. And then you've got host firmware, which would either go on uh, your blade servers, you've got a bundle for that, and you've got rack mount servers or C-series servers. And I don't know how many people watching have tried to get downtime scheduled in a one-day period for you know 700 servers with 20 or 30 different end user groups I can tell you I have enough fun getting two or 300 at a time. So what we can do with the N-1 is we upgrade the infrastructure firmware. We get some additional features. We get the newer UCSM. And we don't have to reboot hosts. We don't have to upgrade the firmware on the hosts at that time. But we're staged for it. So, you know, like I did some upgrades uh, last month and some earlier this year. And the infrastructure UCSM is up to the uh, newer version. And then I can schedule time on a one-off or a business unit per, by business unit uh, basis to upgrade the host firmware to bring that up to date. And then later on down the road, I do another infrastructure upgrade, you know, to 222 or 223 or 2.3 or whatever. And then I can go through scheduled maintenance windows that I can tell people about today for six months down the road, say we're going to want to upgrade all of your servers sometime down the road, let's start scheduling that. It's a lot easier than having to do the whole thing at once and having a whole bunch of business units and a whole bunch of execs upset with you. Um, it really it really makes the platform serve the customers rather than the customers serve the platform. And I should trademark that. <laughs> Well, it makes things a lot better than, you know, going back to the C-series standalone model where you had to touch everything individually, It, it uh, and then it makes things a little bit easier where you can actually just change the policy and then have it take effect on its next maintenance uh, window, you know, either via user acknowledgement or via a schedule. Yeah, and you don't, there, there may be side effects if you run at mixed levels, but not as much as if you just reboot all of your servers at once. Right. Uh, so, you know, we may take 10 machines down today, 10 tomorrow, for some other reason. OS upgrades, kernel upgrades, uh, uh, non-Cisco component upgrades. And I can just tell the team that's doing that, hey, button, tell it to react. It'll take 20 minutes or 10 minutes or 30 minutes. And then it'll come back up with the new firmware. They haven't had to do anything because I've told the system, next time you get re upgrade to this, you know, and I think Robert's connection had we're having a little bit of problem there, um, but I want to take this time right now uh, to 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 let you guys uh, go ahead and ask some questions. Um, I know we haven't had any questions from the Q and A, but if you guys have things that you are uh, wanting to tee up or start asking, uh, feel free to you know ask you know ask Q and A, and then we can provide that uh, uh, here as well. Um, a couple of comments while we're waiting on Steve to, or sorry, for Robert to come back um, and get connected again is, um, I know there's going to be a lot of great sessions. Um, you know, one, you know, Steve, this is kind of a, some of this is a preview to what you're going to be talking about uh, at, your, at your particular session. Um, um, and and I know that, and so I, I definitely would recommend people to join that as well as, you know, for, for those who are wanting to learn automation and, and such, we have, uh, you know, a PowerShell lab, or PowerTool Lab using PowerShell 
um, you know, on Tuesday afternoon from 1 to 5, as well as we're going to give a lot of, uh, yeah, you know, give a, a lot of, uh, um, give, a, give a lot of uh, presentations at our DevNet site as well. It looks like we got Robert back, so. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Um, so I think a you know, great next step uh, to talk about is, you know, you've talked about how you're managing your servers across multiple UCS domains. So, um, you know, to, to, you know, before the, uh, the invention of UCS Central, you were doing those all separately. How are you guys looking to use today or in the future, use UCS Central in your environment? Well, the, uh, the interesting thing about UCS Central is you don't have to roll it out and make it do everything at once. And that's, that's something that we really like because it's hard to change everything at once. So right now we're rolling up to firmware versions that are supported with UCS Central and we're going to use it to uh, do inventory and uh, you know baseline monitoring and so forth, but not necessarily push the profiles and configurations down from UCS Central. So initially we'll start uh, looking at what's out there, where the differences are, and uh, where our inventory lives. And then at some point down the road, perhaps when we do a, a hardware refresh or uh, that sort of thing, we would be able to integrate uh, top-down configuration where it's possible and keep everything consistent from domain to, ma to domain. Uh, and even if you've only got one domain, that's going to make a big difference as well because you've got a, a clearer, less Java-bound uh, interface to look at things and then when you go to add another domain it's it's easy to uh, integrate into UCS Central. So I mean that, you're really looking at doing kind of the start look at the administrative policies, your LDAP settings, your, your syslog settings, all of those types of things. Start there as well as centralizing your inventory. Yeah. You know, where you get that, that one view of your entire environment and then over time, look to um, start taking advantage of the global policies, the global pools and service profiles as new environments come in or as you version your older environments, maybe upgrade the operating system or need to take an outage anyway, so move it from local to global at that point in time. Yeah, exactly. And Eric, if I can interject something here as well, right, you know, we worked with Robert during his of his first three um, domains and after we created the service profiles in the first domain one of the things we wanted to do was take those same service profiles and create them again in the second domain now you know as you know and some other people may know there's you know we can we can export that information and import it so it, there are ways to do it between domains you know you want to make sure you don't pick you know you don't don't export the identities like I did um, but that's where UCS central becomes very helpful you know as you're deploying multiple domains to not have to take extra steps to, you know, to be able to get those same service profiles that you're going to use over and over and over. No, that's a, that's a great point. So, so how far along are you guys with Central, uh, uh, UCS Central today, Robert? Is it just you just starting to dip your toe in it, or is it something that you guys are just starting to plan for, or, or have some of it uh, implemented? We're we're starting to plan for it. Uh, you know, we we rolled this out before it was for the firmware supported it, the released firmware, so we're still doing the uh, firmware upgrades across our domains and across our hosts, and uh, we're starting to evaluate, might be the wrong word, but it's close enough, evaluate US, UCS Central using what's called the UCS Platform Emulator, which is a really cool tool that lets you test uh, a lot of the UCS functionality without putting your production infrastructure at risk, and you can point UCS Central at a clone of your configuration that doesn't actually have customers on it, that's all living in VMs on your laptop or your workstation or whatever. So that's that's going to be what we're doing. Uh, we've been talking with uh, some of the guys at Cisco who are working with, uh, who are behind UCS Central, and we'll be doing that more as time permits as far as rolling it out to actually point at the real, uh, real environment. So when you say that you're doing the clone, you're basically just 
pointing UCS platform emulator to your real system to clone the hardware in, as well as doing like a config all backup from your real system into UCS emulator. So then you can basically have one, the logical configuration, as well as the, the physical uh, elements in an emulator form, and then scale out that to the number of domains that you have. So you can really mimic your environment uh, in, in, in a virtual form. Yeah, exactly. And we can we can test things like what happens if I do push all of these policies down to all the machines uh, and to all of the domains. And then I can roll it back to the latest snapshot, which is much harder to do on the physical platform. Right, because you have to deal with uh, customers and outages and all those types of things. Yeah. In an emulator form, you're the owner of your own domain and universe. So. Yeah, protect configuration never gets in the way in the emulator because there's no storage. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, another curiosity that I have for you, Robert, is um, you know you guys have done a lot. You know, UCS Manager gives you a lot of that uh, automation capability. Uh, are you guys using anything like scripting to help even you know speed up more uh, your environment to do you know scripting across UCS plus other things like storage and and such? Or are those things you guys are looking to do in the future as well? Um, I th the, the phrase that comes to mind is copious free time. Uh, we, we definitely are aware of it. I've been watching, there's a PowerShell scripting contest that's going on uh, in the UCS community on Cisco.com, and I believe they're going to be announcing the winners of that contest at DevNet next week in San Francisco during Cisco Live. So I've been, I've been keeping an eye on what can be done. I uh, haven't really had the time to implement any uh, scripted integrations yet. But hopefully when we get through the round of firmware upgrades, get to the point where everything is consistent and everything is cattle, not pets, uh, I'll be able to take a look at that, work with our DevOps team to integrate that into their monitoring, into their provisioning even. Um, you know, there's, there's no reason other than really liking Java that you can't control this from a central platform that's outside of UCS. And in some environments, that might be UCS director. But in other environs, m environments, it might be your management platform, whatever you're using to coordinate, say, your VM environment and your other bare metal. You can use to coordinate this, determine inventory. You know, somebody says, I need uh, 20 new servers that are this class. You can have it pull from UCS, uh, from the uh, XML API. And then if it's, if it's approved, if it goes through your policies or whatever, you click a button and it goes out, applies service policies, applies vNix and NetBoots and rolls the servers out. So there's definitely a lot of uh, potential for the automation and it's all built in, you know, there's no added licensing uh, for, the, uh, for the API access and there's a vibrant community on communities.cisco where, you know, I might have an idea, I don't know how to do it because the last time I programmed it was like Perl 0.1 and I can go out and ask people, how would you do this? Have you done this? And, you know, get help, get some advice, maybe get a script that somebody's written and tweak it for my environment. So it's, it's definitely a lot of power, a lot of potential, and I'm uh, really looking forward to getting the, the time and energy to, to look into that. Are you attending Cisco Live, Robert? I will be there. I'm actually doing two labs this year. So I'll be getting up there Saturday night and staying until the uh, the final tweet up on Thursday. Well, hopefully, uh, maybe you can make our Tuesday night uh, you know um, time where we announce the winner. So if anyone that's watching wants to maybe come meet you, we're having a you know uh, we're having a little party around 5:30 at the in the DevNet zone at uh, Cisco Live, where we're, you know drinks and and what and and hors d'oeuvres will be provided, and we can hopefully people will maybe. We want to talk to you and ask more questions about this uh, directly about your, your experiences. That'd be awesome if you don't mind joining that. No, I'll, I'll do my best to be there. I'll probably be in the uh, social media hub a fair bit, and uh, I'll be around all week. Try the veal. <laughs> well, um, you know, I don't think that there's – if anyone has any questions, please uh, – you know, we'll, we'll stay on the line a couple more minutes here. Um, please ask them directly on the Hangout on the Air event page, um, and you know, feel free to ask Robert, Steve, or I some questions. Are the, you know, Steve, do you have any uh, you know, closing remarks while we're waiting for questions uh, that uh, that you want to bring up? 
you know, uh, you kind of caught me here. I was in the middle of trying to go to the go to the site and look at some things, but you know, I think Robert's covered a, a fair bit of it. You know, I, I think um, as we look at what we've done with C-Series integration, I will say there's there's a lot of really cool things on the horizon. You know, um, we're going to continue to evolve this. Um, one thing we didn't talk about from a supported connectivity standpoint is, you know, we, we have customers who, you know, sometimes want to connect to UCS on one side, but connect to network, you know, other networks on the other side. So these are the types of things, you know, we've worked to to integrate support for within the system. Um, hard drives, obviously, you know, dealing with the management and configuration is something that we're we're, we're looking at how we can improve that. So it's a very powerful tool. It's really unique. To, um, to 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 the industry from from what can happen, you know, the management of, of the C series, and I, I, I we've seen a lot of customer adoption. It's it's really kind of amazing how many people you know have have found a need for rack servers in their environment. So I, you know, it's 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 been fun. It's been a fun thing to work on. Any any closing remarks from you, Robert? Um, I don't think we haven't had any questions yet, so we'll probably close down here in just a minute or two. Okay, well, uh, as I mentioned, I've been doing the integrated side for two years, working very closely with Steve uh, to get through some of the growing pains and uh, learn a lot about the platform. And it's, you know, I've, I I probably shouldn't say this, but I will anyway because enough people uh, at Cisco have heard me say this. When I first saw the machines two and a half years ago, I thought, oh, cool, super microservers with a Cisco sticker. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it took me a little while to see how they were different from anything else and the more I've worked with them over the last two and a half years since my uh, my boss at the time said hey you want to go to the data center and see some new servers and I said yeah uh, I, I've learned a lot more about the platform the platform has grown a lot with and uh, uh, around me and it's been a really cool uh, really cool experience seeing this platform grow seeing it uh, expand in the market and seeing it make my life as a system administrator and uh, a hardware administrator so much easier um, and uh, and it's you know the, the potential for what to do next is is really big there I've it's been a long time in fact it's been since I, I was dealing with Sun hardware and uh, databases on that platform since I last thought wow I wonder what they're gonna do next with this platform so I'm really looking forward to to growing with the platform and uh, making even more efficient use of it through the automation, through UCS Central, through some of the partner integrations and acquisitions that Cisco is doing. That's great. Um, again, I want to thank you, Robert, uh, for joining this. Um, um, uh, do you mind mentioning what your Twitter handle is again, just so people can, can, can follow you if they want to uh, talk to you and ask quick more questions? Sure. It's uh, Gallifreyan. Uh, I've been a Doctor Who fan as long as I've been a, a technologist, about 30-something, uh, so, several years. Um, and you can check out my blog. I've blogged some stuff about UCS and this other technology at rsts11.com. And as I mentioned earlier, I'll be at Cisco Live all week next week. Feel free to uh, find me on Twitter, find me in the social media hub, find me in the DevNet space Tuesday night, Tuesday afternoon, whatever. And Steve, as, as well for you, what is uh, your Twitter handle for people who want to follow you and ask questions? Sure, it's S McQuery, S M C Q U E R R Y. I'm not very original at times, so <laughs> it seemed, seemed, seemed really like a great idea at the time. Um, I, I do want to make a comment about something about something Robert said. So, so when he says Super Micro with a Cisco logo, what he means is, oh, these look like Super Micro servers. We do not OEM our servers. We actually make our own servers. So, our first generation servers look very much like white boxes. You know, we're well into you know third and fourth generation servers now. So we've um, We've learned a lot, and um, the, the platform has evolved. But just, just you know, from an engineering perspective, mm -hmm. I want to make make sure everybody knows they're not OEM servers. They're they're our servers. We built them. Yeah, <laughs> and some custom memory management, I think, was one of the one of the early wins as well. Yes, yes, with the with the two hundred and fifty, absolutely. Well, um, again, my name is Eric Williams. Uh, you can follow me at um, um, my Twitter handle, which is A E R O I C seven eight. Yeah. I'm, 
I'm a, maybe a little more original than uh, Steve, but it's darn hard to spell. But uh, uh, if you if you if you forget those Twitter handles, just always go to our communities website, communities.cisco.com/ucs, and we can keep the uh, conversation going there. Again, I want to thank uh, Robert and Steve for joining this, and uh, look out for our next uh, topic coming in June. Thank you all. Thank you.